Hello BookTube! I've got a miscellaneous pile of bookish material here that I thought we'd go through on this gorgeous, gorgeous June day here in Boston. The, the humidity that had been choking the air for the last few days uh, has washed away completely. The sky is bright blue, the clouds are bright white, the, everything is, uh, the greens are all extra bright because it's been rainy for a few days. Just, just beautiful, beautiful day. And as you can see, I have a new curtain. Uh, behind me here. This is a, a black, uh, sort of a velvety cloth on both sides. The the uh, the advertising pattern that I fell for on YouTube or on uh, Amazon said that it baffles both heat and sound. It hasn't noticeably done either one of those things, but uh, it's a lot more reliable hanging actually on the curtain rod than the old bed sheet that I had that was sort of draped over the curtain rod and would occasionally fall down. This one won't fall down. And it leaves space at the bottom for my little Frida Bean. That's that she likes to lay there and look at the world and yell at people to get a haircut or get a job. Uh, and there's a little space that's almost made for her. So uh, that's a little bit of scenery. There's also a, uh, the other change in this video is holding over from the other day, which is that I am filming on a different setup. I've heard no real vociferous complaints about either the video quality or the sound quality, so I'm hoping that stays true. Uh, but in the meantime... We have a pile of stuff uh, to go through here. The first thing is a package, and it's incredibly thin. So I, it's it's one book package. Another another book delivery uh, is due today, but I thought as long as I'm doing this, I'll just lump it into one video. And I don't ho hold out high hopes for uh, a package this small. I don't hold out high hopes that it will really thrill me. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. This is... Uh, comes out in October. It's a very, very slim volume of stories by Diane Williams called How High That High. Uh, Diane Williams' stories are taught close-ups, revealing entire lives in the span of two or three pages. Her images are daring and her sentences are rigorously precise, demanding attention to every comma and pronoun in descriptions as jarring as, and then we get an example. Shall we brace ourselves and read it? Shall we read it together? I, I don't have the courage to do it without you, but let's see, let's see what an example is here. Her mouth was open. The tongue was curling up towards her upper row of teeth, and the nose was upturned as well. Her eyes were blue, white, black, and orange, and she was ably balancing the lyrical and the dramatic. Okay, that's bad. That is bad. <laughs> that is bad prose. Her mouth was open. The tongue was curling up towards her upper row of teeth. Well, if it's curling up, it's not curling towards her lower, lower, her lower row of teeth. Uh, and the nose was upturned as well. But we haven't talked about anything that's upturned. We're talking about something that's curling. Right? A, a snake that is, that is crawling up a tree is not upturned. <laughs> a nose is upturned because it's permanently that way. Her eyes were blue, white, black, and orange. No one's eyes are blue, white, black, and orange, so I don't know what that means. Uh, and she was ably balancing the lyric, the lyrical and the dramatic. Uh, well, we'll have to see, <laughs> right? That's just one sentence. Uh, it, 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 it nerves me just a little that the publishers thought that that sentence was impressive instead of the, of the reverse. But uh, nevertheless, these stories depict ordinary moments. A visit to the doctor's office or a married couple's hundredth dance together. But within the quotidian, Williams delivers a lifetime of insecurities, lusts, rejections, and revelations, making her work equally discomforting and amusing. Okay, well, this uh, this author has never really done it for me, but uh, we'll see. Uh, it, these, this is basically flash fiction. We'll see what, what this does. I don't have to, to think about it until October, but that's, that's our book package. Then the next thing I want to show you it was a book package yesterday. I was not feeling well yesterday, so I didn't make any videos, but I got a package that was brought up to me by my silly houseboy, and it made me squeal, as few things have made me squeal. Uh, some of you may have already seen this on Instagram. I could not contain myself. I have to show it to the rest of you on this channel. This is the new Norton Critical Edition of the King James Bible New Testament and Apocrypha. So you may have seen the old one. The old one was brown. It had this painting, but it was in a brown frame. This is the new one in the new Norton Critical Design that's going to go out to schools all over the country, where you have uh, the New Testament, you have the Apocrypha, 
you have dedicated readings, C.S. Lewis, John Milton, other things that, that look to this, to this literature or adapt it in some way, and you have critical essays. Uh, this is going to be popular in schools to study the King James Bible, just the Bible in general. And uh, the reason that, that uh, one of you sent this to me in the mail is because unlike the Brown Norton Critical Edition that this first appeared in, that I praised in print, I went out of my way to praise it because it was so wonderful. Just so wonderful. Unlike that Brown edition, this one has blurbs on the back from Jack Miles, Robert Alter, and me. <laughs> and me. I am blurbed by name on the Bible, <laughs> on the New Testament, which means more to me than even Genji. Uh, that This is the blurb highlight of my life. <laughs> I am blurbed on the Bible, on the King James Bible. So I had to show you this. It's probably not the last time this will come up. <laughs> uh, but needless to say, it has been it has been monopolizing a great deal of my attention in the last day. Uh, but then the rest of the books here are from the Brattle Bookshop. I, I had uh, onerous appointments first thing this morning and ended up at the Brattle Bookshop right as they were opening, right as the shop was opening. Uh, and... Uh, it's a, those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it's a great used bookstore right in the middle of Boston that has a great interior. I mean, there, there are three floors. The first two are every book under the sun, just a, a big, boisterous used book collection, fair prices. And the third, book, the third floor is antiques and collectibles, slightly pricier items, in case you want a collectible item or a first edition for a friend or a collector. And then there's a sale lot outdoors uh, that has $1, $3, and $5 books most of them in very good condition and no organization other than price uh, and and a whole lot so thousands and thousands of books not the usual you know the, the strand in new york city for instance has basically one part of a sidewalk that is that is bargain books uh, mostly in terrible condition in the brattle the brattle sale lot is a world unto itself it's not like that you can get you know new condition books and uh, i went there and wandered around uh, and I got a bunch of books. <laughs> I wanted to show them to you. The first one is a mass market paperback. This is a Timescape paperback uh, of a book that I saw on the Bookish Bryant's channel. Uh, it's a Star Trek novel by Sonny Cooper, and it's uh, Black Fire. This is, I believe, the only Star Trek novel that this author ever wrote. It was very early in the in the these professional uh, pocketbook Timescape. Star Trek novels, when I was eagerly anticipating each book as it came out. I very much was. I was familiar. I'd, I'd, been, I'd been a fan, a big fan of Star Trek from the beginning. I was deeply involved in the fanzine world, in the world of fan-generated fiction, which was all that Star Trek readers had for a long time was just that. And some of it got pretty good, but that fan fiction had a great deal of it had commonalities some of which were a little bit unnerving. A great deal of uh, erotic fixation on Mr. Spock, for instance. A penchant for sadomasochistic violence. The type of thing that once there was a multi-million dollar movie, the lawyers at Paramount would not allow to happen under the Star Trek label in any kind of novel. This was still the Wild West, these, these early Timescape books. This novel appeared in between... <laughs> Two novels by Sondra Marshek and Myrna Culbreth, The Prometheus Design and Triangle. Uh, but even though I love those novels dearly, I liked this one as well. It, it caused a lot of, uh, of ruckus in its day. Uh, fans didn't like it. A lot of fans didn't like it. And a lot of fans also... The most damning comment that, was, that w went around in the fanzines at the time was that it didn't seem from this book like Sonny Cooper had read any, uh, watched any Star Trek knew anything about the show. It, did, it didn't seem that way. I never really understood that. I don't think that a reading of this book, even a hostile reading, gives that impression. The author clearly knows Star Trek. It might not be the same take on Star Trek that you would take. But uh, this was... Uh, she was a friend and acquaintance of Gene Roddenberry. And this novel has an introduction by Theodore Sturgeon, the great science fiction author who also authored one of the greatest Star Trek episodes of them all, A Mock Time. Uh, and he also was a friend. So I, I, I don't think that it's credible to say that this is either wretchedly, unspeakably awful, which is what a lot of fans said that it is, or that it's illiterate of Star Trek. I don't think that either one of those criticisms is tenable. I really liked it. 
Uh, it's it's largely a story of Mr. Spock. It's largely a story of, of Spock in disgrace, uh, in the eyes of the Federation, going over to all sorts of demimond characters and there and uh, a strong Romulan presence, including a brief appearance by the female Romulan commander who was such a fan of Star Trek fan fiction. Uh, she appears in the Enterprise incident, and she's never named. We ne we're never told her name, but it's a terrific performance. Uh, I have written quite a bit about Star Trek fiction. I've written quite a bit about how ubiquitous that Romulan commander is in Star Trek fiction, and a whole bunch of other commonalities involved as well. And uh, tell you the truth, although I don't usually agree with the appearance of lawyers on the scene anywhere for any reason, uh, a certain elevation of professional responsibility on the Star Trek fiction front, I think, helped these novels rather than hurt it. This novel has a lot of holdovers from fan fiction that might have been okay in those dot matrix fanzines, but that 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 aren't okay at all for professional work that's going to be in the science fiction section of a bookstore, or that's going to be on a spinner rack with with the latest from Ursula Le Guin or Samuel Delaney. You, you don't want gratuitous sexual torture of Mr. Spock just because you really loved looking at Leonard Nimoy when you watched the show on your grainy black and white TV. That was a staple of Star Trek fan fiction, that kind of stuff. And it's all over this book. Uh, Sonny Cooper at one point, in fact at many points, said that this was her grand sort of swan song summary and, and envoy, or sort of farewell to all of those gimmicks of fan fiction. And they're definitely here. They, they appear also in the Prometheus design and Triangle, but uh, they start to stop appearing. This, this, the, the can't have been, this book can't have been more than 10 or 11 books in, in the Star Trek novel series at all. A series that's gone on to hundreds of books. But it wasn't that much long after this that... Uh, you stopped getting stuff like that at all. You stopped having scenes where an embarrassed Jim Kirk is suddenly confronted with a whole bunch of strangers on board his ship when he's in a mesh thong or anything like that. You stop stop having long, lovingly detailed scenes of Mr. Spock being whipped. You stop having anything like that. It just stops appearing. And I uh, tell you the truth, I didn't miss it. <laughs> I didn't miss it at all. I had them all with this book. And uh, I was glad to see it on, on the Bookish Bryans. I wonder what they'll make of it. They and I, we will be doing a read-along of this book starting at 3 o'clock this afternoon and ending at 3.45 this afternoon. So you can tune in then and find out. <laughs> I wonder what they'll make of it. It's not any Star Trek that they're familiar with, so they might not like it. A lot of fans didn't. Uh, I thought it was very, very enjoyable. Uh, but anyway, that was the first thing I got was Black Fire. I saw this uh, perfect condition mass market payback. So I grabbed it. I have an ebook of this, but in terms of giving it a reread, it, it certainly would be nostalgic to, to do. Does this actually have a number? No, it doesn't. See, this, this timescape took over these Star Trek novels, and eventually they started putting a number up on the corner. So this has to be under 10 in the series uh, for it not to have a number at all. But one way or another, I couldn't pass it up. Uh, then this next one, uh, Carol and Graf trade paperback of a novel that I haven't read in a long time. It's high time that I read it again. This is George MacDonald Fraser, who will will forever be synonymous with his Flashman novels. His character Flashman, a thoroughgoing rogue who's very enjoyable to read about. Uh, but this is a, a, a horse of a different color. This is a big historical novel called Mr. American. In a lovely, this is a lovely trade paperback. I don't think I've ever seen this version of it. Uh, and this is... Uh, Fraser uh, trying to hit a different register. I also saw at the Brattle a nonfiction work of his uh, about his time stationed in Burma that's very, very good. It's called Quartered Safe Out Here. Uh, I, it, I recognize its genius. I, I don't, it's not my kind of book, so I didn't get it because I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't think reread it, and I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't keep it, so I left it out in the wild for somebody else to find where it'll really strike their accord with them. But this book is different. It, Flashman does make an appearance in here, and it's a funny appearance. He has a couple of really great one-liners. Uh, but really, this is a story of a, a mysterious American who struck it rich in a gold mine and comes back to his ancestral homeland of England. And he's got the six-shooters and, you know, the battered 
cowboy hat and the 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 strangely affable direct american manners uh he he falls in with uh edward the seventh king edward the seventh and his mistress and a whole bunch of other uh famous pre-world war one historical figures uh and war walks around in the upper reaches of, of uh, Edwardian society, but <sighs> there's an edge to it. There's an acid edge to pra practically everything in this novel. I mean, it's going to be a joy to reread because uh, when I, I've read it twice now, and both times that I read this, uh, the, when it first appeared, and then I read it shortly after that, and both times I was smiling from ear to ear the whole time because it, George MacDonald Fraser has a command of the English language that is... Uh, overshadowed by the, the sheer raunchy po-faced comedy of the Flashman novel. You you are so busy having the time of your life reading a Flashman novel that you, you can almost forget, it's easy to forget, how beautifully it's written. Really fantastic prose. Uh, and I, when I first read this, and then when I second read it, I was aware of all that. I loved the pacing. I thought the set pieces were fantastic. I thought the historical characters that, that are dragged on were really good. But I could tell the whole time from the edge and the tone that this is a uh, very clear-eyed, high satire, and I'm not 100% sure what's being satirized. I don't think it's anything so simple as just Americans being satirized, I, which makes it all the more it makes it all the more intriguing for me to reread it. I now have a very nice uh, trade paperback. This will last me one reading. This this binding is not all that great. One reading is all I need. Uh, and I will reread this at some point in 2021 uh, and just hope that the penny drops where it never did before. We shall see. Uh, this next one doesn't have a dust jacket, uh, but that's okay. I, if, I have a feeling that I'm going to love it. I don't think I've ever read it, not in its entirety. And if I do love it, I will make a dust jacket for it. Uh, this is uh, by an author that we have met before, and his name is M.A. DeWolf Howe seen this author a couple of times, a literary figure, literary editor of the mid-20th century. Uh, and this is his book, John J. Chapman and His Letters. And that is John J. Chapman. Chapman was a great essayist, a great, a great writer. Uh, and this book is uh, a combination of a biography of him and also letters for which he was famous in his lifetime. I am a big fan of Chapman. And I have a, a collection, a collection of his work, and I've also written about him. I, if I remember correctly, I believe I wrote a long essay about Chapman at least once years ago. I, I, if it's in any, if I can find it, and if it's in any shape to link, I'll leave a link to it down below. Uh, Chapman's life was fascinating, and he, the the main fascinating thing about it, is that he was one of those people who was paying acute, intense attention to every detail of his own life as it happened. Never phoning anything in, always acerbically, uh, humorously watching everything around him. That makes his letters just fantastic to read, but also his essays as well. Uh, a collected uh, a volume of Chapman essays, well worth the time, your time if you can find it. Probably, uh, now that I think about it, John J. Chapman is probably free on Project Gutenberg. Something is probably free on Project Gutenberg. I'll have to check into that and see. I wish that I had found this with a dust jacket, but I'll take it without. Absolutely. Uh, then this next one is by a towering figure in the field. <laughs> this is from the uh, University of Toronto Press. The figure is M. Brock Fenton, who is the grand godfather, the grand poobah of bat studies, of the study of bats. And this is a slim book of his called Just Bats. A tiny little thing about bat ecology, bat behavior, misconceptions about bats. This is all about Chiroptera. This is all about the gigantic family of flying mammals. The, the, the largest family of mammals other than humans, and the most widely spread other than humans, and utterly fascinating. Just utterly fascinating beings uh, that are routinely vilified. The uh, pesticides and uh, destruction of their natural habitat has laid waste to their numbers in the New World and the Old World, and that's just continuing. Uh, this book is from, I think, the 1970s. Uh, 1983, when all the world made sense. Uh, and I will take, I, I have uh, a number of books on bats. 
I've spent a lot of time uh, helping to study bats in the field. I think they are fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Well, I saw this thing for for a dollar. I grabbed it. It won't have anything in it that uh, that I don't already know. But Fenton is wonderful on bats, so I'll take it. Uh, then this next one, as soon as I saw it, I realized that it was uh, missing from my library at the moment, and that can't be because it is so enjoyable, strange, but enjoyable. And I had an extra impetus to buy it. This is Jack Miles's no our book. I almost said novel. This is his book, Christ, A Crisis in the Life of God. And the extra impetus, of course, is that Jack Miles is blurbed on the Bible, on the Norton Critical Edition New Testament, same as I am. Unbelievable that I'm in his company, Robert Alter's company. Unbelievable to me still, after all this time, that I am blurbed on the New Testament. <laughs> the King James Bible. And I'm blurbed. That is just amazing to me. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, in his book, God, a biography, which is, which perhaps the queen is in town, uh, in his book, God, a biography, Miles uh, takes an unorthodox approach that I think one of them people surprised. It's fantastic the way he does it. He takes the Bible as a straightforward chronological narrative of the story of a character named God. He knows perfectly well that it's not that. Okay. He knows perfectly well that it's not that. He takes it as that in order to see what it what that approach will yield in terms of dramatic and narrative insights. And it turns out it yields a lot. The God of biography is utterly incredible. A weird and partially indescribable reading experience. And he does it again in this book. This is him concentrating on the New Testament, on 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 the phenomenon of God taking human form as his own son, as his own incarnation, as an incarnation of a human who can feel hunger and thirst and pain and who can die and who can feel fear. And, again, Jack Miles knows perfectly well how the Bible was written. He knows perfectly well the historiography and the textual apparatus of the New Testament. He was trained by Jesuits. He, of course, knows those things. This is his intentional attempt to read these things without that, to read them in a different way, to see if that different way of reading them yields interesting results, and it does. It absolutely does. I'm not doing a good job of describing either God or this book, but I highly recommend them. Oh, my. If you grew up Christian, if you are a Christian now, I highly recommend them. No matter whether you disagree with them or not, you will know in a minute of reading this author that he bears you no ill will, for one thing. And that's great. You need that. If someone's going to take an unorthodox and very orthodoxy upending approach to what, if you're a believing Christian, you consider to be Holy Scripture, you want them to do it in a respectful way, and he does. He is not the enemy. And if you have a vital, uh, you know, a living faith, a living Christian faith, my, my, are you going to find a lot to think about in these books. So, and, and I realized as soon as I saw this thing that I have God a biography, but not this. I must have given it to somebody. Uh, but I'm going to hold on to this one now that we are blurb buddies. <laughs> uh, this next one is a biography, and I've had it before. We, it's shown up on this channel when I did a biography tour, a tour of my biography shelf years ago. This was on there. I looked at those shelves the other day and realized it wasn't there. I must have sent it to somebody uh, and just forgot about it <laughs> one way or another. It is the, the return appearance in this, in this miscellaneous book video of King Edward VII. And this is by Giles St. Aubin, who did a biography of King Edward VII. There he is as a callow youth, and there he is in his magnificent royal portrait. Uh, this was the son of Queen Victoria, who waited a long time to come to the throne. Uh, and when he did, drastically altered the nature and tone of the monarchy, and thereby altered the age. Uh, the Victorian age, by the time Victoria finally shuffled off this mortal coil at the beginning of the 20th century, she had been dressed in widow's weeds for 20 years and was the only monarch that almost everybody in her kingdom could remember. She'd been on the throne for so long. And Edward was a very different thing. He was known to the British public as a bon vivant. He was known as, as a, a high liver, as a, a gambler, as a, 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 a natty dresser. And he stepped into the role of king, almost, didn't, almost died before he could become king. Uh, had an operation that was kept from the public for a long time, but uh, he is, he only ruled for 10 years, but he very effectively changed the Victorian era into the Edwardian era, 
an era of excess, an era of gaudiness, an era of uh, pomp and confidence, and a degree of humor. I myself think that I am a fan of the Edwardian era. I, I myself think that the Edwardian era is very distinctive from even the late Victorian era. And I appreciate it in a way that I don't think it gets appreciated very much. <laughs> and, and also, I hate to say it because it's so indefensible these days, I also appreciate this king. I, uh, he is my favorite British monarch. <laughs> God help me. <laughs> he seems at once regal and intensely human and fallible. I can't get enough of reading about him. And I have read this book a couple of times. It is, I think, of all the Edward VII biographies that are out there, I think uh, it is the most stylishly written. It doesn't, it doesn't have a whole lot of new material, although it was written scrupulously by its author, who was a schoolmaster uh, for a long time, for decades, and also a friend of royalty, he was a friend of the Queen Mother, uh, and took his job as a biographical chronicler very seriously. So this is, this is actually, it's, I think, more beautifully written than any other Edward book, but it's also really good. It's got a lot of meat on its bones. So I saw it at the panel and thought, okay, you, you, you see a book like this, and you flash immediately to your bookshelves, and real, I realized immediately that I don't have it. No idea why I would get rid of it, unless maybe the only thing I can think of is that maybe it fell apart. Maybe it broke in some way. One way or another, uh, I got it back for a dollar, so that's great. It's going to present an enormous temptation uh, to reread either the whole thing or, or part of it. I will try to resist that, because I do have other readings to do. Uh, then this next one uh, was a find. Perhaps the find of the day. Uh, because I always say the Brattle will provide. It's one of my favorite slogans about the Brattle Bookshop, is that if you develop a lack, if you realize I don't have a thing, if you go to the Brattle regularly, it will turn out. It will occur on the Brattle, if not uh, in the sale lot, then in the store itself. Uh, and I often say the Brattle will provide, but I never say the Brattle will keep providing. <laughs> and this is a book that was a find the first time I found it. <laughs> I found it. And gave it to Mark Richardson, a fellow booktuber. Richardson Reads, a friend of mine up in Vermont. Uh, and that's a joy for me. That, that was no hardship. I, I know it's, it's kind of a Hallmark card truism, but uh, you'll find if you do it that it is actually true. It is intensely more satisfying to give a bullseye present to someone else than to keep it for yourself. It's intensely more satisfying to give than to receive. Uh, and I... Gave, I gave this. I found this book and gave it to Mark and thought nothing of it. The one thing I thought was, you'll never see another copy of that. I was amazed when I found a second copy of it within a month at the Brattle. So now I don't have to be without it. It's this lovely thing. It's Galaxy. With a, a pig with a human head on a plate there. And this is not just a collection, an anthology of science fiction stories that appeared in the old magazine, Galaxy. It is that. It is an anthology of a lot of those stories, and some of them don't get anthologized all that often, so there, there, uh, there's some things in here that you'll pretty much only find in here or in the old back issues of Galaxy Magazine. But it's not just that. The writers who were invited to be part of this were also invited to give a little memoir, a little nonfiction account of what their experiences with dealing with Galaxy Magazine and its editors was like. That's invaluable. Absolutely invaluable. And I read this a long, long time ago. This came out in the 19... 80s, I want to say. 1980. This came out in the year 1980. Uh, and I read it when, it when it came out in 1980. And, and uh, at the time, I loved it for the short stories. There are some authors in here that I really like. Uh, and some authors that I don't like, but that I think are, are displayed to best advantage in this anthology. But in the years since then, the thing that I've wanted more than anything is for that nonfiction component, those memoirs, to be ten times as long. They're an invaluable historical resource that people don't think to do. I, I, I won't single out the handful of authors in the, in the roster here that were churlish enough not to write such a memoir. Some of them did. Some of them just refused. Uh, for a magazine that did a lot to help their career, I think that was kind of radish. But nevertheless, a lot of them did. And uh, I, to find a second copy of this thing in so short a time, it's just unbelievable to me. So now I get to have it myself. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it was good karma. Uh, I get to have it myself, in addition to seeing it on Mark's shelf. So that's fantastic. Uh, then this next one, 
This next one is from 1936. Is that right? Let me double check just to be sure. I don't want to get my facts wrong. Uh, yes, this is from 1936. This is the life of King Edward VIII. Not King Edward VII, my favorite English monarch, but King Edward VIII, my least favorite English monarch. This was the, the son and heir, the, the golden boy, the Prince of Wales that the whole world knew as a shining breath of fresh air, a new age for the monarchy, a new face, who decided to give everything up. The year this book came out, 1936, was the year that he was crowned. Uh, not, he never had his coronation, but he, he, was, he did become King Edward VIII in 1936, and he also abdicated in 1936 in order to marry Wallace Warfield Simpson a twice-divorced American adventurous. Uh, scandalous behavior. Scandalous turncoat behavior. A, the, a, a flagrant dereliction of the highest duty, literally, in the land. Uh, and this is a big picture book uh, that has photographs you're never going to see in an Edward biography. Just never. The kinds of... It's just loaded. It, that's all it is. It's just loaded with black and white photos of him, and very sympathetic uh, text uh, about someone that I imagine when this book came out, uh, the writers and editors of the book thought was going to be on the throne for 50 years. Didn't happen. I mean, that makes this all the more interesting, right? This, this captures a moment that is uh, rolled over in hindsight in all biographies of the Duke of Windsor. It's not rolled over in hindsight here because it hadn't happened yet. So that makes this extra fascinating. Even with a subject that I don't particularly like, I don't have much affection for, for the figure, none at all. Uh, even so, uh, it's going to be fascinating to read a book that was obviously rushed into print with lots of photos in order to celebrate a new reign. Little guessing that the, by, by the time the book was remaindered in bookstores, the king would be gone. Uh, so that that's just too fascinating for me to turn up for a dollar. Absolutely, it'll go on my monarch shelf with uh, with the Edward the uh, the seventh book, and then the final book for this for this uh, weird bookish uh, collection of stuff is a great big thing founded at the Brattle Bookshop. I've always wanted a copy of this, uh, and now I have it, and it has a nice uh, one of those plastic library dust jacket covers. This is edited by Philip Van Doren Stern, and this is an annotated. Walden uh, by Henry David Thoreau, and it's this is this is just the standard uh, annotation where you get uh, lots and lots of illustrations. You get the text, and you get uh, annotated, uh, you know, numbered digressions on whatever the annotator thinks is worthwhile to mention. So the text will be numbered with the annotation, and then you get the annotations to give you. Uh, trace down every illusion in the book, all that sort of stuff. That would have been enough for me to get this. I, I've mentioned on this channel before that I have a sort of a love-hate relationship with annotated versions, uh, especially when it's an annotated edition of a book that doesn't require annotation. Uh, Walden does not require annotation. Uh, but nevertheless, usually the reason, the thing that sways me, the thing that makes the love of the love-hate relationship is that usually when someone does an annotated edition like this, it's a labor of love, and you can tell. And uh, I, that is definitely true in this case. But it's not just that. That would have been enough to make me, excuse me, to make me get this for $3. Uh, but there's more to it, because the person who owned this volume put a lot of love and care into it. Uh, they, uh, I want to give you an example of what they did. I, I should, it shouldn't be hard to find. Uh, they annotated it themselves. Uh, I want to show you... Uh, an example, because it, it, it just astonished me. Uh, yeah, here we go. They annotated it themselves and read the previous owner with a ruler. Those, those are ruled, <laughs> those underlines. That, that's how neat they are. And in addition to that, whoever had this made it a repository of everything they could find about Henry David Thoreau. All sorts of clippings about Henry David Thoreau. Uh, book review of Richardson's uh, A Mind on Fire, uh, little bits and pieces from other newspapers of a day's honoring Thoreau, commemorating him, whatnot. Uh, where's the rest of it? Yeah, there's a whole bunch here. Just look at all this stuff. Whoever had this 
put piece after piece after this was whoever whoever had this thing this was their thorough repository anything they encountered in the paper or in book reviews that had to do with henry david thoreau they put in this volume even if it didn't have to do with this volume specifically and they dated them too that is just loving care absolutely loving care and i do it myself all the time i if i have if i pull out a book review from a journal that touches on the yeah, why i don't have the book the specific book that's under review but it touches on something that i do have and that i intend to keep i put it in there so all my spencer reviews or all of my wyatt reviews or whatnot somebody did that with this and i can only assume that somebody then died and that that's how this ended up at the battle uh but i was i'm I absolutely thrilled honored to, to put this in my own collection and keep it until I die. <laughs> so And maybe make more annotations. I could easily see myself doing that. So there you go. That is a kind of book mountain for you. We'll do a Steve Pyramid of uh, the annotated Thoreau. Uh, Galaxy. 30 years of Galaxy Magazine. Okay, let's, let's make sure we can see this. Uh, I'm using the laptop to film here. Uh, Giles St. Aubin's Edward VII. Uh, very stylish, very good biography. Christ, A Crisis in the Life of God by Jack Miles, my blurb buddy. Just Bats by M. Brock Fenton, the sort of uh, godfather of bat studies. Uh, Life of King Edward VIII, a highly illustrated thing designed to dash off the presses to celebrate a new reign. Uh, John J. Chapman and His Letters by DeWolf Howe. Uh, Mr. American by George MacDonald Frazier. Uh, and a strange MacDonald Fraser novel, but one that very much will repay uh, with a reread. Black Fire by Sonny Cooper for a, uh, a read along on the Bookish Bryant's channel that will be done uh, this afternoon. And uh, the King James Bible, the New Testament, with a blurb by yours truly. <laughs> I can't resist showing it again. Unbelievable to see. Just unbelievable. I thought that my blurb happiness had reached its greatest ecstasy with Tale of Genji, but I'm blurbed on the Bible. <laughs> so it's going to take a lot to, to outdo that. But anyway, that is your your uh, sort of miscellaneous Booker's Hall. If there's more, if more books come in the mail, you'll be the first to know. But otherwise, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book 2.